Well, welcome to the Lead for Pollinators Creating Pollinator Habitat webinar series. I am Michelle Colopy, Executive Director of Lead for Pollinators. Our webinars are supported by the following sponsors. And there we go. There we go. Hispanic Marketing and Public Relations. Visit hispanicmpr.com for interviews presentations, and more. Beauty Beyond Belief Seeds specializes in wildflower seeds, heirloom vegetable seeds, grass seeds, regional wildflower seeds, and special use wildflower mixes, including their line of four great pollinator mixes. Shop for your garden and pollinator habitat for Western U.S. planting zones at bbbseed.com. Two Million Blossoms magazine will awaken readers to the vast diversity of pollinating insects and animals. This quarterly magazine will delight, entertain, and name those well-adapted creatures buzzing through our world. Because the more we know about pollinators, the better we can provide habitat. Subscribe today using the discount code word LEAD and receive $5 off the subscription rate for one year. Visit twomillionblossoms.com. OPN Seed has partnered with Lead for Pollinators with pollinator mixes created for beekeepers and anyone who wants to attract and support pollinators. You can get native seeds for Eastern U.S. planting zones at OPN Seed. Go to the Lead for Pollinators website donor affiliations page and select Support Our Cause to view featured seed selections and a portion of sales generated from our website will help support our work. Mr. Webinar, live webinar presentations are recorded and can be viewed through our pay-per-view partner at Dove Audio Visual. Visit our website for the recorded Login to Learn webinars and select a topic to view at your convenience. Our speaker today is Anne Aquillo, Vice President of Government Relations for the Scotts miracle Grow Company. Since 2007, she has led all federal, state, and local outreach and education to elected and appointed officials for the company. Prior to working at Scott's miracle Grow, Anne was a public servant for 12 years, working in a variety of roles in the legislature and administration. Her last duties were as Deputy Chief of Staff to Governor Bob Taft. Anne was so helpful to the incoming governor, Ted Strickland, that she was also asked to stay on and help with his incoming transition team. Her ability to work with both political parties made her successful then and is a hallmark of her work now with Scots. Anne is a self-described yenta. She's always looking to connect people and ideas together for the greater good. That's why she has always been tasked with unique projects, both in the public and now in the private sector, such as the one we will discuss during this webinar. Our Creating Pollinator Habitat webinar series concludes today with this presentation and the lessons learned about the public-private partnership to plant pollinator habitat along an Ohio highway. Anne Aquila will discuss Scott's community grant programs, corporate and highway projects, and encourage other companies, large and small, to collaborate in their communities for the benefit of pollinators. Please welcome Anne Aquillo. Thanks, Michelle. Hey. Hi, everyone. All right, let me go ahead and get my screen flipped over here so I can put my talk on. There we go, and I will share that. And let me find my deck here really quickly. So thanks everyone. Thanks for letting me be the, uh, the caboose, I guess, to the pollinator series um, to talk about a project I, I am really proud of. Um, and when Michelle asked me to do this, um, and Michelle and I have known a num each other a number of years, thanks to the great work we've been doing with Michelle and her pollinator activities, uh, and then the great activities for our company and how much we love pollinators. Um, I was really honored to be able to talk a little bit more about this project. Um, I, I, I say that Scott's is a great company. It's a family company. We were founded in 1868. I'm going to get into that here in a second. Um, but we, uh, we are a, a, a merging of, of two families that started our company. And Horace Hagedorn, who I'm going to show you next, um, always had a, a saying about find a need and fill it. Uh, and that's one of the great hallmarks about 
our company as well is that you can find all these great opportunities to make a difference, whether you're government relations or your R&D or you're a salesperson. If you have a passion for something, Scott's is really good at encouraging you to follow that and make a difference and grow more good, which is our, our big umbrella campaign to talk about all of our charitable activities. So, okay, so I saw the, the lineup and some of the other webinars that were talked about before ours this evening. Uh, and what's unique about it is, well, gee, you know, why an interchange? So let me tell you a little bit more about our company and how we got to the idea, idea of doing an interchange project. Um, and it starts a little bit with our history. So don't worry, I'll jump through this really quickly. Again, a lot of people know about Scott's Miracle Grow. Uh, world's largest lawn and garden company. We help consumers every day have great lawns, beautiful gardens. If you have a pest, we can help you take care of that too. Um, and as I alluded to just in my opening comments, we were founded in 1868 in Marysville, Ohio. And the picture that is at the bottom of the screen is the storefront that O.M. Scott, a Civil War veteran, used when he started his hardware store. And I'm pleased to say that in 2021, it is still our storefront. It's our associate store. Um, it's been updated. Now that I think about it, I should probably include a picture of that in my deck. Uh, and it's a great destination. There's lots of history and memorabilia. And then you can also find all of our current products. And we do a lot of teaching and interacting with the community. So it's a wonderful uh, sort of commentary about where we started and where we're at. We are actually down the road on 750 acres. Um, oh, my, my dog is now going to try to be a part of this conversation. Oh, there's my husband getting him. Um, so we, we have 750 acres down the road now where we have our largest manufacturing facility, our largest R&D facility, and our world headquarters is all housed there in Marysville. But we're still in the same hometown where we've been since the beginning. Miracle Grow Plant Food, which is the nice gentleman in the red shirt, is Horace Hagedorn. He founded that company on Long Island in the 50s. His son, Jim Hagedorn, is our current CEO. And he was part of the effort to merge our two companies in the mid 90s. So Scott's was the lawn idea, Miracle Grow was the plant food. And then when the companies merged in the, in the 90s, they started to build other things onto it. We have Ortho. For a while, we had a retail store called Smith & Hawken. But right now, what we're most excited to do is really help people grow things. So when you think about consumers, one of our newer partnerships is Bonnie Plants. So now it's not just what you do to feed it, but also how do you start with the plants? And we're talking about seed entry and things along those lines. And then now we also do indoor gardening. So that would be Arrow Garden and more importantly, Hawthorne Gardening Company, which is uh, hydroponics, indoor gardening for state regulated cannabis markets um, and other indoor hydroponic growing. And again, we've been in business now for 153 years, and we are growing, growing, growing. People are very engaged with the category, and we are very thankful for that. So that's a little bit about us. And I wanted you to kind of understand, we have this long history. We always say we're kind of still led by a family because it's one of the Hagedorns, and there's very much that feeling about our company and what we take uh, and what we do with the world. So that's all great and good, right? We're selling stuff, we're helping people grow things. But what we also do is we realize if gardeners want a wonderful piece of earth and they want to express themselves, the most important thing a gardener needs is, is pollinators to help them do that. We always say that we focus on water, but we also focus on the importance of habitat. And as a company back in 2016, we had sort of a realization moment that you know, if we were really gonna show people that we love pollinators, we needed to make a promise. And our, our biggest promise was under our ortho brand, which was we said we were gonna get out of neonics. And again, we didn't say it was necessarily as much about the science, but what we did feel is that there, were there was enough conflicting information. And more importantly, our consumers were confused. We couldn't clearly label if a, if a product had a neonic in it or it didn't. And we thought that the best way to make sure that consumers knew we had their backs when it came to pollinators was to declare if it is an outdoor product uh, and we think it could ha affect a pollinator, we are not going to use neonics anymore. Now, I will tell you, we do know that neonics are very effective with indoor issues like bed bugs. And so we do believe that that's a good use of that technology, but we don't want to do anything to hurt our pollinators. So we made this decision in 2016, and when we, we called it the pollinator promise, we also realized that while it was good for us to do something with our product, we also had to do stuff to help people understand more. So we made a big commitment with pollinator gardens, 
we started to focus on park settings. In 2017, we formed a partnership with the National Parks and Recreation Association to really use that as a setting for us to continue to educate people on the importance of pollinators and to also create lands that would have pollinator habitat. We now will have what we call the pollinator bio blitz, which is a big campaign we do kind of starting right now in June. We do online messages. We work in a number of different states, as you can see on the slide. Um, and then we have citizen scientists who help us do this. And we're really proud of all the great work that we're doing on sort of our outreach and our long-term commitment to pollinators. What was great about this when we launched it in 16 was the idea of like, wow, we can do all these things for pollinators in other places. But what about that 750 acres we sit on in Marysville, Ohio? Or what about all those other places across the country? We have about 80 different locations in about 26 different states. You know, maybe we should think about what can we do on our own properties to sort of foster the idea of pollinator habitat? So that's when we kind of turned inward and said, let's try do some, trying to do something on our campus. So the first thing we did was really the idea of um, creating a pollinator prairie. And we were lucky that, again, because of the promise, we had a lot of people excited about it on our team that wanted to do something very visual. Um, we have our own exit off of Route 33, and we know that we get a lot of cross traffic, people kind of cutting through and getting to Marysville. So we dedicated a portion of our land to a pollinator habitat. And as you can see there, uh, we have signs that go with it. Um, we, we, again, wanted to make sure that we had a lot of different people involved. So it was everyone from folks in our R&D team, our facilities folks, folks who work on our ortho brand, all work together on this cross-functional project inside our company to figure out where we were going to do it and then how we were going to design the land. As you can see there, even though we might know a few things about pollinators just because of what we do, our most important idea was that we had to consult. So we worked with the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, our friends at the Union County Soil and Water Conservation District, and in typical fashion, we also talked to the city of Marysville, the Union County Commissioners, and made sure we were talking to everybody with some excitement to say, look at this great announcement we've made, look at all these great things we're doing with partners outside of Ohio, and more importantly, look at this great idea of what we're going to do here on our campus. Um, we ended up having what we called our Prairie or our Pollinator Week. We had lots of activities on campus to get our associates excited. We invited folks in, we did a ribbon cutting, and we really tried to coordinate our efforts with what we could do on our campus, also with all the great pollinator activities that June in 2017, going on sort of around Central Ohio to make sure we could carry that message and get a lot of attention for what we were doing. So let me show you a couple pictures. One, this is from, this is a year later when, after we established the habitat. And again, you can kind of see in the second picture, some of those barns over there, that's actually right in front of, uh, kind of across the street from our R&D facility. Um, and that's where we do a lot of formulation work. So it's a very heavily trafficked area. If you kind of continue down the street, that's where our big manufacturing facility is. And again, we have a lot of folks from the community who cut through and are around our campus. So we felt like it was a very visible place for people to understand. And more importantly, we tend to get visitors from time to time, and this is sort of a high traffic area. And then this is where we're at in 2020, a few more pictures of more of the prairie as it's growing into being. We again did some initial plantings that were a lot of color to make sure that we could get it off to a good strong start. And people were thinking and, and paying attention to what was going on on Scott's Lawn Road as we kind of established this prairie and gave it some time to grow. So that was a great celebration. Everyone was very happy with how it turned out. Folks like Michelle with us were, were with us that week to celebrate. And we kind of said to ourselves, gosh, maybe, maybe there are other opportunities for us to do it. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, we happen to be off Ohio State Route 33. We're just outside of Columbus, again, Marysville, Ohio, a little town where we've been since the 1800s. And we had just gone through a big bridge widening right at Scott's Lawn Road. But it is funny to work for a company that has its own exit. Everybody knows where you're at, right? Well, when they put the bridge back up, the bridge looked great. We were real excited about that. that but everything else about the interchange looked really sad and needed some work. And we had talked about it with some of our friends in the city and in the county and said, man, we should do something really exciting now with this interchange because 
we are really the gateway to Marysville. What is something that we could do that could promote something that's important to us, create a beautiful habitat, and also speak about Scots and welcome people and, and be something though at the same time that you could kind of zip past and know a little bit about. And for us, once we embarked on the work, we could also use to say, this is another part of our commitment. And lo and behold, that's when you start going, hmm, maybe we should think about that interchange as a habitat. So that's exactly what we came up with was, look, we had our own exit. It's our gateway. It definitely needed work. And most importantly, when we went to the city, when we went to our county partners, and when we even talked to our state departments about it, ODOT, EPA, everybody was really excited about this idea. Well, geez, you know, we've done some, some pollinator habitats on highways, but we've never really partnered with a company on it and not a company like Scott's. And then for us, it was, wow, this is sort of a, another iteration of our commitment. Even if visitors are just going past our exit to understand who we are, what we're about, and what's important to us. So that was, and I will tell you, I, di I didn't go into great detail in this deck. Um, it's been a few years since we started this project, but I will tell you the idea of doing it, getting to the actual holding of hands and planning and the meetings was really a very long involved process. It took a lot of meetings to get ODOT comfortable, to make sure our city was good, to make sure we had great um, enthusiasm from our facilities folks, uh, Tony and Ed, two guys I work with on a lot of projects who are both on vacation this week, or they would be here with me, um, were staunch supporters of the importance of doing this and the importance of making sure we really had this opportunity and we could work hand in glove with our state partners, our local folks, and make this work. So it was, it's definitely been a labor of love. And it was funny as I was preparing for today and thinking about all the work that went into it, you kind of forget that. I guess it's a little like, you know, going into labor, you kind of forget all the pain that it takes to get you there, but you also remember it fondly and know how much it was worth all of that effort. So a um, little bit about the habitat. So if you look at our interchange, we have kind of the four quadrants. Um, we of course know how to design beautiful habitats. We have them all over our campus, but we really realized with this, we were gonna need some outside help. We worked with Hidden Creek Landscaping, and then specifically we sat down with ODOT to get their ideas on what is a good habitat? What have you learned from other projects? And they suggested that we work with Pheasants Forever. They were working with them specifically on this project at that point back in 2017. And so they were very influential and helpful to us during the planning and the, um, and the, the planning and the planting phase, sorry. We worked uh, with ODOT and Pheasants Forever really closely on seed purchase, making sure everything was certified. Um, I remember Ed, our one head landscaper, talking about making sure you get the right mix at the right time. You're going through all the hoops to make sure you're planning what is appropriate for your habitat in your state. And then uh, for a site preparation was a big deal. So we had a lot of disruption when they put the new bridge in. Um, that didn't mean that we didn't have weeds. It didn't mean we didn't have to prepare the ground. And there was a lot of work that was put into making sure that we got, we were able to kill certain things off. So we had good fertile ground to work with and that we turned things over to make sure it was ready for planting in the spring. So this is where we are. And I, I think Michelle had one of these pictures on the cover. You can see in the picture on the left, that's our headquarters there in the background. And then you can see our wonderful, beautiful, shiny Scotts Lawn Road Bridge right on the other side. And this is kind of the painstaking work that was going on out there. And I will tell you, um, I work in that building off there on the left. Um, and there was always, I was always trying to figure out ways that I could go out and see what was going on, you know, how we had a lot of rain the summer or the spring that we planted, and that delayed things. I also created more weeds, and, and Ed and Tony and I felt like we talked all the time just about what was going on with this project, making sure our leadership knew what was going on, um, especially as we had to wait for many things to take hold and, and for people to understand that it's a lengthy process to establish habitat. So that's, that's kind of a great picture of where we started. So, so again, what is interesting about this was just, we had a few, I think, critical learnings that came out of it. We have, and I, and I bucket them for this group into two phases because 
the first phase was interesting in its own right. And then what the experience has been since that first phase in 2017, has been interesting and challenging in its own right as well too. So I'll get to that in a minute. So one thing we learned again, and I, and I kind of highlighted earlier, is making sure your seed purchase is, is critical and that you do it right. You've got to make sure that you work with folks, get the right blends. I mean, I think um, it was great to hear all those different vendors mention sponsors at the beginning who know how to do this. It's always good to ask for help. We were very lucky in the fact that we had Odont willing to help us, Pheasants Forever, all of these local partners that were willing to point us in the right direction because we also didn't need a little bit. We needed a lot to do this project and making sure you can get those supplies at the right time is really important. Um, Ed, if he were here, would say that weed and grass pressure was a big problem for us. As you can imagine, these used to be hills covered with turf and trying to wipe that out and make sure you do it in a way that you can wipe out the weeds as well and create the, the opening that you need for these seeds to flourish um, was, is, was painstaking and difficult and took many efforts. So that is one thing I know that he highlighted, highlighted when we talked about this a few years ago at Franklin Park. And then we work really closely with a landscape crew on our campus, that's our contractor. And then we have our own screen, our own greens folks who work on things. And there needs to be a lot of collaboration and cooperation to make sure that everything is going the right way. And making sure that there's that good communication back, back and forth between us with ODOT, with our local partners was really important to make sure we got this kicked off the right direction. And again, probably that's how I ended up in the middle of all this is all the different phone calls we had to make to make sure everybody kind of knew what everybody else was doing as we rolled along with the project. So, okay, so fast forward. This is 2017, we get it in the ground. As everybody knows on this call, pollinator habitat doesn't turn around in a heartbeat. You gotta stay with it. Okay, so, so now we're in phase two. We've got it all in there. What, what, can, what can you assume from any kind of project where you work with outside partners? Well, the first one is, these are a little pithier, I'm going to say, than I think some of our initial learnings, which is change is a constant. So literally the year after we got started with this project, ODOT decided they weren't going to work with Pheasants Forever anymore. They were taking the project back in-house. So suddenly a bunch of relationships we had forged with outside folks Suddenly, we had to figure out how to do that with just ODOT. No problem. We're good at working with people. We kind of figure that out. Um, we also had um, the pandemic hit. So as I was telling Michelle and Terry before we started today, I have not been on our campus full time since March 13th <laughs> of 2020. I mean, it's been more than a year that I've been sitting here in this office trying to do my job, trying to talk to people about what we're doing. Um, and I get to our campus occasionally. I, got, I went there for my COVID vaccine. Um, we had sort of a garden kickoff where everybody drove through in masks and waved at each other. We tried really hard to create community where we can, but a well-traveled interchange, which was supposed to be a, a good shining star for us, has really become a much quieter area. It doesn't have the, the road traffic. You know, during the pandemic, people definitely weren't traveling as much. But definitely Scott's Lawn Road doesn't have the traffic that it, we expected it to have when we planted the garden. Our, our plan, our R&D facility, of course, is still running full time. But it's just not the same level of ability to be able to highlight it. So it's really changed how the campus has focused and the idea that we could proudly point to our associates and say, this is why we come to work every day. These are the things we support. Um, surprises happen. So here's going to, this is going to lead to um, a picture that I'm going to actually show you, or a picture that I can't show you in a moment, which is um, while we were given very um, concrete and strict instructions about how to manage the interchange from ODOT, which was fine for us and our groundskeepers to deal with, um, we are also on Route 33, which if you're in Ohio, you've probably heard of something called the Smart Corridor Project basically a way of improving technology where cars can talk to uh, signals. So smart vehicles, the idea of connecting to the web and light traffic lights being able to know where cars are at and kind of all this wonderful technology. Well, that only works when you can put it up the smart corridor if you have fiber. So kind of mid to uh, sort of spring to mid last year, they were putting fiber in the ground and they disrupted 
two of our pollinator habitat beds on one side of Route 33, which we were told by ODOT that they were going to go around it. But again, communication being what it is, um, they disrupted a big piece of the habitat for us. So those are your surprises. You can't always be sure that even when you think you've got all the kinks worked out, that the government isn't going to surprise you with something that even ODOT wasn't entirely sure that it was supposed to happen that way. They thought they were helping us protect the habitat and there were some communication errors. So that leads us to our last key learning, which is stay the course. Look, no one expected a pandemic. No one expected them to put fiber through our habitat. No one expected a lot of different things that have happened in the last 12 to 18 months, but you have to sort of stay the course and realize it's still worth the fight. So Ed and Tony and I still are staying in touch, even though I don't get to go to work every day, and they're still working on the habitat. So let me show you. That's why there's no picture of the interchange. My last conversation with Ed last week was thanks to the disruption that we've had from the fiber project, we still don't have flowers yet in our pollinator garden this year. What I will tell you is they've gone from annual to perennials. We've done the seeding. We're crossing our fingers. I kept saying, Ed, please, even just a couple flowers just so that I could show these people. Um, and he said, keep hoping. Maybe by the end of the month, we'll start to see some changes. And I'm hoping that maybe when he and Tony get back from their well-earned vacations this week, maybe I'll have a good picture to share on the lead pollinator page here in a couple of weeks. So that's kind of the stay the course message, which is, look, we're all still invested. Ed and his crew is still out there trying to make sure there aren't too many weeds. And we are really still talking to our leadership about the importance of pollinators. So let me leave you with that. Helpful last thoughts. One is leadership support is crucial. Our biggest learning through this was helping people understand it's a process. We love it when we can plant flowers. I'm impatient when I'm just dealing with my tomato plants. Like I'm a good Italian girl. I need me some tomatoes. Let's roll here. Habitat is a long process and you got to have your leadership support to understand, as I say to my CEO a lot of times, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So talking to them up front, explaining why we're doing it, explaining what the process is going to look like was really important. And then more importantly, was making sure they were cheerleaders for us as we were doing it. Seek out lots of help. If you have not figured that out about me and the way our company works, it is, hey, we might know stuff but you may know more and you may have a different idea and let's all work on this together. Michelle said, you know, when we created our pollinator prairie, it was invite everybody to your pollinator party. Well, we invited everybody and their brother to our pollinator project. And I think that's what's made it a good success, even with the challenges we faced. Um, I think people are still excited about it and realize what we're trying to do. And I think it's also, you can know a lot, but you still don't know everything. So there's always critical learnings you can, you can get from somebody else. Um, number three might be our mantra for the evening. Assume there will be hiccups. I'm certain there will be more, but we'll still keep at it. And then as, as we've kind of pointed out here, and I'm sure has been covered in other webinars, it's a lot of work up front. And we knew that going into it. I will tell you, Ed's fondest hope is that now that we've done it here and we have our prairie on one piece of campus, he is convinced that we can figure out other places to put it on campus. I think we're probably going to need more people on campus for us to pull that off. But there is, up on the long term, it's a great way to change your habitat and to, um, again, change the way that you're maintaining things. So that's been, I think, a, a wonderful thing as well, too, is like understanding that you got to put work up front and then you get great long term results and that we definitely do. So that's, uh, that's, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for letting me talk about a project that, that I truly love. I mean, I was involved in the Pollinator Promise when we launched it. Um, I helped with that effort. To be involved in this interchange is really kind of a culmination of what I do, which is working with federal and local and state officials and trying to solve problems and being able to do this project specifically, even with its challenges, is definitely something that's really important and special to me. And Michelle said it would be good for me to make sure at the end of my talk that I put all my contact information. And I am always happy to talk to folks about our experiences, what we learned about this, maybe some key takeaways or advice. Um, one of the greatest things about Scott's is, you know, we are always willing to share our lessons. And again, I have a great team behind me. It's not like any of this is done by one person but we have lots of really smart folks who can also provide technical knowledge if I can't answer your questions. 
Michelle, hopefully that covered everything that you thought I should talk about with this group today. On the it, it, it did, and, and it's wonderful how it, it, things have really come in a complete, uh, a full circle. We started out with Dave Riddell at OPN Seed talking about planting pollinator habitat, and his second talk was really about setting those expectations. And it, he's had a number of uh, corporate projects that they would start them and they would, in the sense, the corporate leadership wasn't behind it because the expectations were set inappropriately. They thought the first year, it'll be beautiful. And I find that even within my city, in the city of Akron, when they were redoing their um, sewer system and they were making, in a sense, retention ponds, but really po huge pollinator rain gardens in a sense. Okay. But they misled really the city council saying, it'll, be, it'll look like this. Okay, in five years, it will look like that. So, and as you said, you've got your perennials that are now starting to grow down. So next right. year they will grow up. You know, so it, it takes that time. As as I always tell people, it's really easy to destroy Mother Nature. It's really it takes a long time to put her back. Oh wow, that's a great line. I might have to steal that one from yes, you. So, okay, that's because a good you know, one. even as you were uh, prepping the soil along the highway, you had to deal with the construction putting back crappy soil, and you know they probably did. Yes. Um, and because it was just the whatever was there on the landscape, which had been dug up, and it's you know, and cities and government usually drop in sand. It's not soil. It's not even composted leaves. Yeah. Um, so they bring in that weed bank which then just takes longer to get rid of it. Right. Um, right. So I think you, certainly this has been a wonderful presentation to help those corporations really set their expectations appropriately. <laughs> and, and to call you and ask about those different things. I know it was interesting you talked about the issues of dealing with the different partners who maybe have specific contractors they work for, either to prep the land or the seeds. And I've heard that from a number of groups and even a 30 acre project I did we had a problem with the land prep person that the company who owned the land purchased or hired that person and um, they wanted to use just an herbicide on 30 acres of overgrown former mining land, which even when I went to you folks at Scott's, you said, you know what, uh, no, you need to just burn it off. <laughs> and, and that's and then the third try of herbicide, which still did not kill everything, we had to set fire to it. And when you have 30 acres, that is the easiest thing to do. No, <laughs> so, no, for sure. For sure. Was, well, yeah, when you've got people who we make it so we know when it's appropriate to use right. it and when it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. If we're saying, oh, I think you would need to go another route, like, don't listen to yes. me, listen to them for crying right. out loud. Right. So, yes. And so I think we often will run into, and some of these projects run into groups that are, we work with just this company, whether it's seeds, whether it's the land prep, or whether it's even the equipment, I, you know, you want to make sure, is it truly the best for the property you're working on? Right, right. Well, and I was going to say, for us, we were lucky because we have such a big sort of footprint that we have a great dedicated team. And Tony Bond, who hands our facilities, brought Ed in, and, and Ed Baldwin is just amazing and has done so much to make our campus beautiful, but he also has a lot of great knowledge. So we had a leg up on that. But, I, but he was also smart enough to say, hey, I haven't really planted a pollinator garden like this. What is the right equipment? Okay, I think I have access to this. Can we get a hold of that? I mean, we were, he was also hitting people up at R&D. Do you have anything that looks like this? I mean, it was, it was really a team effort to try to get those first plantings done. And you're right, even the slope of the hills, just get yeah, the poor so soil condition. And then it's like, you know, you also have cars going 70 miles an hour past you. For us, and I, and I didn't go into this, when we did our first designs, it, it, they were much more intricate. And ODOT's first thing was, this is lovely if you were going by at 20 miles an hour, like you do on Scott's line, you know, yes. they're going, think about 70 and how fast. And so you end up learning that it's about bunches of color that you think you can get people's attention. So they kind of go past you and go, oh, that's pretty, but they're not, but yeah, you're not going to expect them to really like look, you want them to focus on the road, even as they're <laughs> going past you. So yeah, that was, that for us was like, oh, it was such a pretty design. Okay, we'll throw it out the window and start again. Which, right. That was yet another aspect of this as well. Right. And certainly, I think with roadways, you always have to all be concerned about, and I'm sure ODOT was, wild was going to attract, but also those sight lines. Yes. I, I was yes. talking to someone who wants to put a uh, habitat along a curve coming toward the bottom of a hill. 
Ooh, but oh, they have a okay. cross street coming in at the bottom of the hill. And I said, all right, let's look at the sight lines. You cannot plant all the way to the curb because the person coming to the stop sign won't see people coming down the hill. Right. So you have to always look at this from a variety of different viewpoints, not just I'm going to have a field of wildflowers. Exactly. And I think with many corporations, when you look at, okay, you have this huge lawn space out there can you plant there based on what utilities are there? Because if you are updating utilities, say every five years, it, don't plant there. <laughs> so, or choose a different design, you know, leave a big mowed path. I, there was one uh, company I was talking to who had a, a three acre field and a tree in the middle of it. And they had, they had a picnic table under the tree and the staff loved to go out to the picnic table. So we said, okay, we'll plant, uh, we'll make a path that's maybe four lawnmower strips wide. So everybody okay. can still get to the tree, the path and right. to the picnic table under the tree and the rest will be flowers. So you still want to make sure it works with the culture of the company, right. but also really the land use underneath as well as on top. And, and that's true. And if you came to our campus and Michelle, I know you've been there. I mean, we really are an outdoor culture. It, it, it's, you will see just as many people on their phones or outside sitting somewhere on their laptop trying to get work done and you're right you know for us it was this prairie the prairie that we did initially was again a showcase here's something we want to share with the community the, the interchange was that same way that was area we weren't using but we have tons of walking paths and lots of outdoor activities and i know that's something that ed continues to think about well how can we wrap more into some of those pieces but not use the lose the utility of how we use our outdoor spaces and when we did have very limited gatherings last year, we were always outdoors, spread out with a mask on. I mean, we've been very forward thinking about how to prepare and deal with the pandemic, but you've got to make sure to your point that you don't lose the, the different, you know, uses and the, the nice things about your campus that your associates, your employees, you know, love about it, even in, the, in this pursuit. Right. Well, and I think it's, in a sense, if you use the yard scale of anybody's home, if the front yard, you really don't do anything in it, your kids don't play there, your dog doesn't use it, then that's a place to put your pollinator flowers, especially if it's full sun. If right. your backyard is where the kids play, the dog does their business, then that's not where the pollinator flowers should go. You that's know, true. That's your, very, your dog very true. and your kids stepping on bees and clover. So you've got to look at how you're using that land. Um, and you know, certainly I know in the cities, as people like Dr. Mary Gardner tried to plant lots in cities, what was found on that land, which also might impact the flower growth, whether it is the old style way of tearing down a house and you just dump it into the basement and you bury it, you're not going to grow much. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, or was it, you know, a former, is it a brownfield really that needs cleared up? Because some of those chemicals can into the flowers and then right, have right. Them killing yeah, at that point it can, it can pull things out it's like yeah you have to think about what is that next use and, and where that land has been at for right. sure for right. sure so you know like when i have talked with companies it's you you want to look at that land they're not going to be using for built for company expansion for say the next five seven years um because you it's going to take five to seven years for your habitat to look really good I'm just thinking, hey, we'll put it over here. Well, now we want to add a wing. Okay, well, what do you want to do with the pollinator garden? Like, that was right. the worst thing ever. Like, look at how pretty it is. Well, yeah, but yes. now we need to put people on it. Like, that yes. would just, yeah, that would, again, it's why it's good to have your leadership involved. It's good to have your facilities people bought into it. And then for us, too, you know, the other thing, and you kind of alluded to it with picnic table, is really having associates. So yeah. people being excited about it also makes them go, okay, this patch is going to turn into flowers. You promise, right? Like I'm totally <laughs> with you on this. I mean, trust me, I had those conversations, which it just looks like a big brown patch. Stay with me, man. Stay yeah. with me. I promise we're going to get there. So, so even having that enthusiasm for people who are, you know, I have a, a very good friend who um, is a beekeeper and just, you know, just, just having people who are passionate about these issues that also work on our campus, I think has encouraged us long-term to keep going. Right. Well, so, and in a sense, you, you kind of have two, well, three different projects. You have a very planned, structured, pollinator little garden. Then you have that prairie behind it. Right. Which is, you know, it's different soil and space and everything else based on the one next to the highway. 
So right. that you have three examples that you can show folks of, okay, you could do something very structured, very formal. Um, you can have that wild prairie, but there are, and all three of them have different maintenance issues. Yes. Yeah. Because you still have sure. to maintain them. You're not just plunking down seeds. You still have to either uh, mow things down in the fall right. um, or, or manage it for dry spells. Um, now, do you folks have uh, beehives on site or maybe native bee houses or we, places we, more? We did, and I will tell you with the pandemic, I think a lot of that stuff was moved out. So we have a very big, um, in relation to where like the, the pollinator prairie and the, 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 as you put it, the garden and the prairie, across the street, we have a very large associate garden. And I feel like that, I can't remember, we've actually done, we, we did a lot of upgrades to it last year during the pandemic. I guess a great time to do it. Nobody was there, right? Yeah. But we have a, a much bigger meeting space. We really enhanced our raised bed gardens. We made it much bigger. Um, and back there, we used to have bees on campus. Um, I don't believe, again, I was only there for, I've only been there a couple of times. I don't believe those were, are there now that we've done those enhancements because it's as much of a meeting space. But we do have a lot of vegetable gardens very close. So there's lots of different things to bounce off of on our campus. And then just beyond that is a lot of our trial plots. So there's tons and tons of growing kind of on that other side of the street for our campus, which again is very unique because it's who we are. I mean, if you look at the back of our R&D, they're doing container planning trials and you, you can walk amongst those and see, you know, how big can you get your zucchinis or whatever. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's always like lots of growing on our campus. But yeah, we did have the bees for a while. And I apologize, I just don't know that answer right now. But my friend Chip will know. So I'll check in with him and find out and get you that answer for sure. Well, I know in some uh, pollinator projects that Terry and I worked on, the companies we did offer for them, you, know, you can connect with local beekeepers and have some beehives there. But we really stressed for those companies, and I guess I'm saying this for companies as they watch this uh, you know, later as a recorded webinar, that you want to have a contract with those beekeepers. Mm. Even if it's an employee, because the employee may not be an employee forever. <laughs> so you've got to look at, so like honeybees, they are an attractive nuisance like a, a swimming pool. So, you know, and I know the, the Scotts campus is not fenced off by an eight foot high fence. No. So the people can get there. Um, you know, the, the drunk driving by could go, I think I'm going to knock over that high. <laughs> so you want to make sure that, and especially on a private corporate land, that the security people know who that beekeeper is, um, when they're coming on site. You've got to specify all those things so that it is a working relationship. Again, one of those other partnerships you develop so that everybody is safe and secure, the company as well as the beekeeper. And the bees, let's just be honest, yes. and the bees are protected yes. too. That's important yes. as well. Yes, yeah. So, because um, I know I was taking lots of notes um, just to ask you some of those things. So have, I don't know if you guys, and I, I don't know if I should ask this, because I know you're a lawn care company, but at the same time, by planting pollinator habitat, many people will plant habitat so they don't have to mow a lawn. Mm -hmm. You don't have to really uh, be concerned about maybe carbon emissions from a, a, a gas-powered mower. So mm -hmm. have you guys looked at any cost savings for not doing as much land maintenance on, those, on the, the acreage? On um, well, I would tell you a couple different things. One is our vision is everybody can express themselves on their piece of the earth. So we love it if you want a lawn, if you want to go out and sit in my front yard and we'll just enjoy the grass and I'll stand there barefoot. We are also totally happy if you want to have vegetable garden or a flower garden, whatever your fancy is, we can help you figure out how to have a good landscape. So what I can tell you is we are okay with all kinds of different ways of, of having your landscape. And that also means being really thoughtful to, hey, if you're in a drought situation, maybe you want to look at xeriscaping. Maybe you don't want bluegrass. Maybe you want a different kind of grass. So, so we kind of tend to look at there are lots of different climates, locales and challenges, what's the best way to create your landscape? So I'm not hurt by that comment at all. I am going to tell you though, that grass is really good at sequestering carbon because it has a deep root structure. And you're right, if you can manage it to either through genetic um, engineering or through breeding and things along those lines that you can get the best qualities out of grass, grass is actually a really great carbon sink. I mean, you hear a lot about trees and that's great, but grass is actually, even though I know I will get the questions about monoculture and all those different things, grass is actually a really great way to deal with soil erosion, 
cool off areas around your house. So do I have the cost analysis of one versus the other? No, I don't. But I can tell you that ultimately we're a growing company and we feel that as long as it's not AstroTurf, we're pretty happy. As long as you're participating and enjoying the outdoors and figuring out what works for you and your family. And, and I think these can all coexist. And you're right. If you came to our campus, you would find this big prairie and right next to it, you would find a lot of grass. And we always joke, we're Scott's Lawn Road, so you better have a nice lawn. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th that's also a piece of who we are as well, too. Um, the gentleman that we were talking about, Dr. Phil Dwyer, I mean, again, one of the great things is we are always looking at new varieties and what's appropriate for different locales. And I think that that's an important thing. You know, we found that out west the last time they had really bad droughts. Well, what kind of grass do you have in your front yard or your backyard? I don't know. It's grass. Was it fescue? Is it bluegrass? Is it zoysia? You know, is it St. Augustine? Goodness, I didn't know what any of these were until I got to Scott's. But you start to realize, well, that's probably not the right variety for you to have here. So, so I think for us, a lot of it is also just making it more understandable. And as I was telling you guys, you know, we do a lot of consumer insights. We have in, millennials are at, entering the age where they are first time home buyers. And man, my husband and I were lost in the sauce at our first house of trying to figure out how do you take care of it? You know, I still remember my husband being like, I can just throw extra fertilizer on there. I won't do anything. Uh, game over, burns the grass. I mean, you learn all these things kind of through trial and error. My godfather used to always say, if you put a plant somewhere and it doesn't grow, it just means move plant. That's not where it goes. Try somewhere new. And so I think for us, we look at it as, wow, we have this whole new group of individuals going into houses for the first time, having families and dogs and cats and all of that. What can we do to help educate them so they really understand how to be good stewards in their backyard? Some of it starts with, what's that at your feet? What's that bush over there? And then how do we make sure you know how to take care of it in a good way that's really appropriate for your environment? Right. So yeah. that was a really circuitous way of saying, no, I don't have those numbers. Okay, that's all right. Because certainly you know, when I've talked to folks about planting pollinator habitat, and I always show them how I did my yard, but my yard was flat, or it is flat. It okay. has a slight slope. So I didn't have to worry about anything really running off. But there are so many people who want to plant their hills. And I'm, I always tell them one for safety. You're, don't dig up your whole hill. The, all the soil is just going to run down into the ditch. Leave some grass strips and do it in sections and or leave the grass strips in between just to hold things in. That's true. That's because true. You've got to have, yeah, you have to have that buffer. Otherwise, all the, the cleared soil, in a sense, you've made to put in the, the pollinator seeds is all going to run off. So leave right. some grass strips, as well as, again, as I had spoken before, leave, have that understanding of the culture of your land use. Grass has its place, but it really doesn't have its place out in desert areas. <laughs> um, I know I've, I've made so many people in Arizona uh, jealous of my habitat in my front yard, but we get 36 inches of rain a year. Yeah, well, it, we're Ohio. I mean, like it rained all last week. For I yes. just kept going, can I just have one day of sunshine so I go right. and visit outside for a little while? Right. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a different thing. And what we always say, though, is if you're really smart about how you're dealing with water up front, you're dealing with better with water quality issues downstream as well, right. too. So, yeah, it kind of all goes together of, again, it goes back to what's appropriate with where you're at. And then to your, you also had on a really good point, which is what's the use of the area? So, yeah, I, you, you met my big dog here at the beginning. You know, we have a 10 year old who plays volleyball and she's always bouncing balls around. And there's a lot that goes on in our yard all over, front, back, side, the whole Miguela. So for us, grass is like a really important functional area, but we do have lots of flowers and lots of landscape and, you know, and a, and a sad tomato plant that I'm still working on, but we're getting there. Well, but I think that that kind of goes back to um, getting those experts. It's not just, uh, killing the grass and throwing some seeds on the ground. There has to be some design in it. And even for the average homeowner, really reach out to a landscape designer. Yes. Because yes. they'll help you really look at the soils, look at what's best to plant around trees. Sometimes you really can't plant anything around. Even grass won't grow around the tree because the tree is right. sucking up all the water. So right. it, it's, it does pay in the long run to find those experts and yes, pay them. Yes, that's for sure. And, and I'll also say too, um, as a little bit of a plug, I'm always amazed at 
different stores, especially like your local garden centers. We have a great one down the street that I feel like I, I can go and ask all kinds of dumb questions and they're really nice to me and they help me on, you know, all kinds of things we need around the house. I, you know, I, 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 you learn from your neighbors. To your point, I think if you're just inquisitive, there's a lot of resources out there. And yes, to your point, if it's a really intense project, we just did one in our backyard. Um, it, we yeah we went and found help because we knew we were way over our skis on how do, if we pull this all apart how do we put it all back together but if you're just starting and hey i think i've got a plot of land where i can get that pollinator mix let's go give it a shot you know can we get this kind of bush or that kind of bush that we think would attract it sometimes it's also just good to tip your toes in and, and go to that local garden center and say hey i'm looking for pollinator friendly or ohio natives i am always really pleased at, I can think of a handful of little nursery centers, probably all 10 minutes away in different directions that I know I've marched in and went, okay, I want to plant stuff, help me out. You know, it's, it, and, and, and how much you can learn and build those relationships. And then that leads to other things. The other thing I'll say too, is we're really lucky here, more on the community gardening side. So we have Franklin Park Conservatory right down the road from us. And I know you've got resources like that in Northeast Ohio, uh, those are great great places to connect to, make friends, learn, kind of it's the community teaching you. If you're willing to put a little time in, you can get a lot of knowledge out of it. And I know that's been a really good experience for me, kind of professionally, but also personally as well, too. Well, and again, to get those experts involved from a corporate standpoint, you're not just having your, uh, no offense, your lawn mowing guy, as a landscaper, <laughs> so I mean, that's all person. it does at, at a corporation <laughs> to try and educate maybe city leaders and others on how to transform the landscape. You want to bring in a landscape designer, maybe a soils person, um, you know, and, and the plant people, the, the native plant people, it's always good to plant native plants. They will be more successful than non-native plants because they're why they're the natives why yeah. they made it through right? right because also from a corporate standpoint you don't want to then be responsible for invasive plants taking over <laughs> the your neighborhood so plant natives yeah yeah yes. for sure well and i think you raise a really good point you know i'm willing to take some risks in my backyard but if we're a multinational multi-billion dollar company it, there's a different level of what exactly are we going to welcome people into. And so we want it to, to your point, have thoughtfulness behind it. And that's really important. And it goes back to the, it takes a team to get it done. Yes. Yeah, it does. So, you know, this has just been a wonderful discussion. And I uh, and certainly am hopeful that, again, this is just coming full circle for us and helping corporations realize that they can do these things. Um, and it is, in a sense, it's a one-time check to pay for the seeds and prep the land. You just have to wait for Mother Nature to, to come back. So this uh, certainly uh, concludes our 11-part webinar series, Creating Pollinator Habitat. Uh, these webinars are available through our website to refresh your memory. You can present them to local groups, your beekeeping, garden, farm, or environmental group, as well as corporations, academic campuses, and governmental groups interested in creating pollinator habitat. Now, June 21st through the 27th is National Pollinator Week, and it is a perfect time for you to get busy planning and planting your own habitat. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.